Hi, this is Thomas Keegan, LibertarianProgressive.com, also BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash election channel. That's where you're going to find independent and third-party candidate interviews. There's more going on on Election Day on November 8, 2016, than just the presidential election. Of course, we have Congress, a co-equal branch of government, and we believe here that that co-equal branch should get co-equal coverage in the news. LibertarianProgressive.com is an independent media organization. We interview independent third-party candidates who are on the ballot, and this year we're specifically focusing on candidates who are the only third option in their specific districts. We believe if a candidate has gathered enough signatures to be on the ballot and has a statistical chance to win, then a responsible media We'll include them in the debates, interview them to educate and inform the public of their options. And today we're interviewing Rich Turvey, Libertarian candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives, District Number 6 in Indiana. And you can find out more information at turveyforcongress.org, T-U-R-B-E-Y-F-O-R, congress.org. And Richard, um, or Rich, I'm sorry, welcome, sir, and good to talk to you today. Is this your first time running and what got you inspired to get on the ballot and try to represent your six district, sir? Yeah, actually, uh, good afternoon. This is my first time running. Never have sought a public office before after spending 17 years in the Army, uh, in the Army Reserve. Decided after watching this year's races unfold just how fed up I was been a lifelong independent and started to pay more attention this year than most at how poor the choices were on the national level. Then I started to do a little bit more research about my specific district and started to see a pattern and a trend emerge where my representative, uh, the current representative Luke Messer, is a strict party line voting Republican. Um, And, you know, that's all well and good, I guess, uh, if that's exactly how the district feels. But I think that he tends to feel that he votes for the party and not the people. So I started to do some research and found the Libertarian Party. All right. Awesome. And now, has there been any debate so far for your district? Are there any debates coming up, sir? Uh, Actually, there is a debate scheduled on October 20th at IU East in Richmond, and that is being hosted by a uh, TV station there in Richmond, and that's WGTV Online, which is government TV there out out of Richmond. All right. Well, that that's good. That's really good. And so, you know, the debates can make a huge difference. That has been the case in the past. And it's a long time American political tradition to have the debates before the election. And let's go through your platform issues here and uh, what you have on your website. You have veterans, taxation, restoration of civil liberties, the national debt, the war on drugs, national defense term limits, health care, right to bear arms. Let's start with term limits. Uh, You're trying to impose term limits and you want the public to impose term limits, but should that also, you know, what I mean by that is per se by electing the, uh, you know, I I guess your opponent is an incumbent. Is that right? Sounds like it. Uh, Yes. uh, There's the the Republican uh, opponent is an incumbent. Uh, He has been in office now for six years. And the Democrat uh, opponent that I have is, from all accounts, I haven't met him personally yet, but all accounts, a nice guy, but a perennial candidate. But as far as term limits go, I don't think that our founding fathers intended for a politician to be someone's permanent vocation. And so I am going to sponsor legislation that would cap your term or your um, elected office at 12 years. So for the House of Representatives, you can win six terms, and then it's either move up, on, or out. Um, Same with the Senate, two terms, 12 years. 
And that gives the legislative branch the, op- the opportunity to work with, it, at a minimum, two separate presidents. Okay, that sounds, um, it's, that sounds like the consensus of what people want when you look at the polls. And speaking about polls, I saw on your website you were stating some polls about the satisfaction in Congress. Um, I think it's 10% or something like that. Uh, yeah, last time I looked, the approval rating for our current Congress was at 11%. And that's well, pretty poor. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty poor. That's um, that's right. That's eleven percent disapproval rating, and uh, or eleven percent approval rating, and um, that's uh, it's not. It almost sounds like it would be the opposite, but no, it's uh, ten or eleven percent, or maybe even less approval rating. What about the restoration of civil liberties? What's happened with our civil liberties, Rich? Since our founding fathers drafted the Constitution, uh, we have seen an erosion of the civil liberties that we have uh, been afforded. Um, However, our lawmakers continue to take more and more of our abilities uh, as far as free speech, freedom of religion, uh, right to bear arms. uh, And I would like to return our republic back to the way that it was intended and maybe you might be talking about some of the recent activity of the nsa the fourth amendments regarding the patriot act there's lots of examples i suppose free speech zones (laughs) yeah absolutely sure um now there's i mean the as, as an army officer you know, I have a top secret security clearance and never in a million years could have I could I have imagined that some of the programs that I've been involved in while serving in Iraq are actually being used here on the home front to spy on uh, citizens who have done nothing wrong. You know, the, the discussion on for the Second Amendment discussion on taking and adding people that are on no-fly lists, which are unvetted, um, not been uh, proven, anybody's been proven guilty on the no-fly list to take away their rights to purchase a firearm. That's right. And not just a firearm. I mean, the whole due process in itself, that's one of the hallmarks of Western civilization of the United States. In fact, you know, you get to be tried by a jury of your peers, know the evidence presented, you know, in front of you, know your accusers to have a fair and speedy trial and et cetera. Exactly. And it seems like that wipes all that. Should the no fly list be looked at regardless of the second amendment? Yes, it should. Uh, there should be criteria. Uh, there should be a judge and jury. There should be a good look at it. You know, there are people that are, here trying to perpetrate bad acts against our nation and against the population. But we have to have more than just uh, your word or someone's word against them, or else we're going to turn back how we were back in the 50s, 60s and McCarthyism. Uh, Let's jail the communists. Let's run them out of the country, you know? Sure, absolutely. Um, that's the mob mentality, basically, and uh, and that's making decisions that are uninformed, and that's and people make uninformed decision when they don't have all the facts and don't have access to all the facts. So, what about transparency and accountability? And do we need to audit uh, more parts of the government? Do we need to audit the Defense Department? Do we need to audit the Federal Reserve? Do we uh, are there how, how would you approach um, accountability and transparency? Well, we definitely have to have someone watch the watchers. Um, no one is above indiscretions. You you hope that they are, but you hope that they also don't get um, drawn into the cycle that seems to continually corrupt government officials. And again, I think that goes back to term limits. Uh, if you don't have someone that's a 30-year uh, representative, they can't build the coalitions, build the relationships, and end up 
there to serve corporations instead of citizens. Right. And now you also have here the national debt. Last time I looked, it's about 19 trillion. You almost have to take a look every once in a while because it'll keep going up on you. But uh, how important is that? Some people say, you know, the debt is no big deal. Um, There was a lot of talk about it a while back, but it seems like the last 10 years I've heard about it from some people. But what how much importance is it and what can we do about it? And this is another thing that drew me into this election. Uh, My father and a grandfather. And to see that right now, as of Monday, it was at $19.58 trillion in national debt. And I know that because I just had a forum at Ball State University here that I spoke at and raised this issue. But with with the national debt, we, we have to stop having elected leaders that are writing checks on two and three generations backs from now. Um, my grandchildren are not going to be able to pay this debt down. Um, we are looking at 100 years of potential um, our country being behind financially because of all this. And I'm a huge proponent of cutting unnecessary spending, doing a hard look at all of the government-funded programs, and getting out of the business of funding programs that private enterprise can take in take a better look at and do a better job at. Um, I'm a huge proponent of enacting a fair tax, which would then increase the amount of revenue that the government generates to pay down this national debt. Congress should not be able to draw, or any of our representatives, Senate, Congress, President, should not be able to draw a paycheck until they can file legislation which includes a balanced budget and the fair tax from what i've read would eliminate the corporate tax completely it'd be a national sales tax and there's some versions where there would be vouchers or some kind of safety provisions for you know the very poor and it it, supposedly it can create a lot of jobs the prices would kind of stable out it would of course have a lot less paperwork i think uh, as far as people filing taxes every year yeah what it does it would it would allow your employer it would allow private businesses and even the federal government if they're your employer to stop collecting federal income tax and then in turn the average employee or the average person would then start receiving their entire check the entire um, listed earnings and as a consumer you would make decisions on what you're going to purchase and the federal government would get a 23% tax on the one, the, uh, the fair tax as I've seen it. There would be a 23% federal tax added to the price of all goods for the end user, the end consumer, um, on non-consumable goods. You know, when you go to the grocery store now, you know, you don't pay tax on food items, but that would continue. Um, and like you said, there are stipends and there are voucher programs. And as I would work to sponsor this legislation, I would become a lot more in tune with those um, nuances of the legislation. But the the first and foremost is to get the fair tax enacted and then work with the separate states so that they too can raise their revenue through the same method. Um, in totality, it should cap out at 30%, I believe, is what I've, the research that I've done. It might actually have the very, very rich pay more in taxes. I mean, Warren Buffett says he pays less, you know, of a percentage of his income to taxes than his secretary. And this would probably have a lot of people who aren't documented pay taxes. And so it it could actually be an excellent idea. In fact, it's the only constitutional form of taxation from what I've read. And in Florida, we have a state sales tax we don't have a state income tax and there's about seven other states like tennessee washington that do the same thing and fully fund their budgets so um it's been a proposal for a while and has a lot of uh, strong arguments and what about um the war on drugs uh that's been going on since the nixon administration where when he declared a war on drugs 
Can you tell us the state of uh, the war on drugs, what we should do about it, what are the consequences that has been, and what would be the consequences of what would happen if you had your way about it? Now, we've spent over a trillion dollars in the so-called war on drugs, and all it's done is raise the prices of street drugs from 1973, I think is when Richard Nixon, or maybe 72, I'm a little fuzzy. I wasn't, I was born right around that time, so I don't have the memory. But uh, the, the war on drugs was instituted, and you've seen an increase in supply, an increase in demand, an increase in price. And you see more criminals that are locked up for nonviolent drug offenses than what you see locked up for violent crimes. You see states spending millions of dollars for police officers to patrol streets and look for people that are using or committing minor drug offenses. Um, And I have friends that are in law enforcement, and they love the idea of being able to stop focusing on minor possession crimes and start focusing on property crimes and crimes against people. Um, That would be one major advantage of stemming the flow of the war on drugs and starting to decriminalize um, drugs. The first step we would have to take, in, in my opinion, would be to decriminalize marijuana. And I know that a lot of people think that we should just right off the bat decriminalize all drugs, make everything, you know, legal. Everybody can do what they want. I I understand that. But just like I said earlier, the erosion of American liberties, um, we don't want to jump into a 500 foot deep pool right off the bat. Let's, let's start small. Let's start with decriminalizing marijuana. Let's, let's look at the states that have done it and done it successfully and then model, let, let the states model their programs after that and allow the federal government to um, make revenue from the control and the sale of it instead of trying to stop it. Start to take the money that we spend right now. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and for the remaining drugs, um, do you think it should be treated more as a health issue or an education that's, issue? That's where perhaps? I was going. That, that's where, with the remaining money that you would use to typically try and stem the flow, then you start to work with public programs and start to educate people about the dangers. You start to give people options so that they can get into treatment and get off of the deadly drugs that uh, people are putting into their bodies because when when addicts start, yes, you know, they, they love the high. They love the feeling and the euphoria. However, as they start to get too far down that path, we need to give them a way to come back. We need to work with them. Um, how, however we do it, it, it needs to be a, a very feasible and easy to work through plan so that we can help save these lives of uh, people that – end up down those dark paths. Yeah, and so I take from what you're saying that you fully support the Second Amendment. The people that want to put more restrictions on it, basically the argument is to reduce crime, but actually a bigger impact to reduce crime might be what you're saying here is to end the war on drugs and have a better economy. So uh, they kind of go hand in hand, I suppose. Everything goes hand in hand to some point. Now let's... um, Segue to healthcare real quick. Uh, you do, do have that listed as an issue as well, Rich. Keith, and again, folks, we're talking with uh, Rich Turvey, Libertarian. He's going to be on the ballot November 8th. He has a debate coming up with the uh, status quo candidates um, for the U.S. House of Representatives, District Number 6 in Indiana. And you can find out more information at Turvey, F-O-R, Congress.org. And so what is your stance and your approach regarding health care, sir? We need to, first of all, repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, And with that being said, I still believe firmly, um, I'm a pancreatic cancer survivor, and heaven forbid I would lose my daytime job. I don't want to lose the ability to to get health care. So we should still have 
rules in place so that everyone is available or is afforded the opportunity to get health care. However, it shouldn't be a, a federal mandate. The IRS shouldn't be the ones overseeing the federal mandate. Uh, they're, the free market should prop itself back up. Uh, insurance companies should compete for people's business, and this, the competition will allow people to choose the plan that's best for them and most affordable for them um, so that everyone does receive the health care they deserve. I don't by any means want a hospital or a doctor's office or a health care provider to turn away someone in need. Um, however, they, you shouldn't go broke um, just trying to insure yourself and your family or trying to sustain your life and receive the treatment that everyone deserves. All right. And when would you say was the last time we actually had a free market health care system? Uh, I think it was prior to me being in the workforce. I honestly couldn't. Yeah. I mean, it was probably a few years before. <laughs> I was just saying, I saw an, an interview not too long ago with somebody saying about that um, debate regarding health care that a long time ago you could get a catastrophic plan for maybe $300 a year or something like that. And insurance was more about insurance, kind of like car insurance, you know, car insurance does not cover oil changes and things like that. So it's more insurance and the prices were way, way down and there's a lot less regulation involved in that as well. And now we're going to save the last two issues um, you have here on your platform, veterans and national defense. Uh, let's try to see, we have a caller calling in, if you don't mind, Rich, if maybe they can just ask no, a quick fine. question here. Um, caller with the 407 area code. Uh, yeah. If you have a quick question, please go ahead. Uh, 407 area code. Please say your name and what your question is. Hi, my name is Ed, and I was just wondering how he felt about um, getting back to uh, getting rid of the Department of Education. All right. Uh, okay, education. Uh, thanks, Ed. We appreciate it very much, sir. And so, Rich, how would you handle education? Um, I was actually just uh, about a month and a half ago uh, lucky enough to attend the Friedman Foundation's closing ceremony. The Friedman Foundation was founded because of uh, the fight for education choice, which is now their new name, Ed Choice. Um, and I, I firmly believe that parents should be able to work to educate their children. It should be a parent's choice as to what type of education a child uses or gets. I don't believe in training to the test. Um, the Here where I'm at in Indiana, we have the state I-STEP test and our teacher's salaries and our teacher's progress, uh, career progression is tied to the results of their students' I-STEP tests. And there are some teachers that are gonna get tremendous um, career progression, tremendous uh, raises because they're in a good school system. But you may have a, a very good teacher in a school system that's struggling or in an area where the, school, the students may struggle a little more with different subjects. And so you can't, you can't tie their pay and benefits to those types of programs. But I, I do believe that it has to start in the home. Um, you have to have involved parents. You have to have um, parents that are making the choices for their children uh, to move into the direction for the education they want their children to have. And just a follow up, do you think regarding the state of how education is nowadays, like there shouldn't be discrimination in schools or anything, but do you think we should get rid of the Department of Education? I, I would definitely support that. Um, I think that the education should be handled at the state level and and unless we start to see a tremendous decay of the level of education that um, Americans are receiving, the federal government shouldn't step in. Okay. And now your issue on your uh, platform is veterans, and you are a veteran, and also um, national defense. Could you tell us how, you know, how has the U.S. been doing in that situation? Um, obviously, you're running because you're not completely satisfied with the status quo. 
So right. what should our national defense be? Like if you could imagine 10 years out, what would you hope to see our national defense look like and the way we treat veterans? Oh, the first thing is, is as a veteran, and like I said, I'm a pancreatic cancer survivor. Um, I use the veterans healthcare system. So um, I'll start off with that, with, with how we treat our veterans. Um, the, we made a promise to veterans to take care of those who have served. And I think that the um, American public owes that uh, promise be fulfilled. Um, the VA healthcare system has done great things for me. I know that there are problems within the healthcare system. I've not faced those. I've been very fortunate. Um, they've, they've given me great care. I've talked to a lot of very good, solid providers. Um, you know, if I have a problem, I call and I get an appointment. Um, I'm lucky I'm in a, you know, Midwestern rural, rural area, so that may help, but others aren't so lucky. And, um, recently when I had to use the surgical side of the VA healthcare system, I was kind of appalled at the fact that in Indianapolis, Indiana, there were veterans that had to drive three and four or five hours to get specialty care. And so I would love to see a program enacted to where if a, a veteran who is forced by their circumstances or by their choice to use the veterans healthcare system, that they're able to use it more as a choice uh, so that if you have a local healthcare provider or a local specialty care provider uh, that's easier or more beneficial for your situation, you can go see them, but the VA healthcare system still pays for it. Um, I just think that that would save money for the travel expenses, the time, and it would free up the appointments at the larger metropolitan areas like the Indianapolis Hospital um, for people that are in the local area or for people that elect to come there because of what ails them. As, as far as the Department of Defense, um, you know, right now, the, the Department of Defense, the services are in a drawdown phase. Um, you're seeing a lot of very good junior leaders being forced out, um, junior non-commissioned officers, junior officers from the Army, the Air Force, Marines, Navy, they're all being forced out because of budget constraints. But we got into those situations because of the, the way that we procure items within the government. Um, I, I still boggles my mind as to why uh, the government does their procurement system the way they do. Um, if they decide that they want to buy a, a nine millimeter pistol for the, for the army, let's say, you know, the Beretta nine millimeter pistol that I used when I was in, or I still use, uh, is inadequate, you know, it's, it's an adequate, not inadequate, sorry, but it's, it's a very good pistol. I mean, I, I personally own one as well, but the, the process shouldn't be that the government sends out a notice and says, Hey, you know, bid on these and send us, they should just say, Hey, we're looking to buy a nine millimeter pistol or a 45 or whatever, send us what you have. And then they can test them and then move forward. We shouldn't give the specifications we should see what the free market brings in for us. And that would cut millions of dollars from the budget. I was involved in a program in Iraq that um, it for 78 remote controlled Humvees, we spent, I'm sorry, for 26 remote controlled Humvees, it was $78 million. Um, and that's just ridiculous. $3 million per Humvee when a group of soldiers built the same setup for under $50,000 plus the price of the Humvee. Um, wow. So there are problems there. Well, you'll definitely have a you know, unique perspective to bring to that in Congress, hopefully. And um, let me ask you, Rich, uh, who are some of your favorite people, past or present? Favorite people, past or present? Yes. Uh, that's, that's, okay, that's an odd question. Sorry. Um, I... I would definitely have to say that in in my lifetime, I have really looked up to um, when I was a kid with the uh, Ronald Reagan was president. He was the first president I really remember. And I do remember, you know, I was probably 10, eight years old when he was elected. Um, so, you know, I think after he left office, it kind of went downhill a little bit. Uh, you know, he 
he allowed the, the country to thrive and he he was uh definitely i think the most positive president that i've seen in my short life uh and then i also just look at our founding fathers i mean the the risks that those young men took for the the country and for themselves um you know to to put it on the line for a, a vision that they had compared to what the current status quo was Absolutely. They put everything on the line. They signed on the Declaration of Independence, which would be considered treason. And so, yeah. Uh, Rich, what final words of wisdom do you have um, for your constituents, for the United States as a whole? Because we're looking, you're running for the U.S. House. There's people listening, whether they're in Indiana's 6th District or not. You stated the uh, congressional approval ratings earlier. And so please leave us with uh, your final words of wisdom here, sir. I just spoke this week at Ball State University. And uh, when I was talking in front of the group of students there, I told them, I said, you know, they may not agree with my point of view. They may not like what I'm trying to do. And and that's fine. But I, I really was happy with the fact that they were being educated to the race. And that's what I, that's what I want people to do is become educated about the people that you're voting for. Don't just go out and pull a ticket or pull a a lever because you've always voted red or blue or yellow or whatever. Make sure that you're educated. Um, you know, I told the students at Ball State that you know I'm I'm not an attorney. I'm a you know 20 years ago, if anybody would ever told me that I would be running for U.S. Congress now, I would have laughed because you know I enjoyed my time in college. I didn't try to set myself up for future political success by becoming an attorney or, you know, studying all the nuances of all the constitutional law ever written. Um, I'm an everyday American citizen and I've served this nation for 17 years in the active or reserve component and felt called to do so again. Um, what I've been telling constituents as I talk to them door to door at events is it's, it's time that we send a leader and not a lawyer to represent us. Um, we need to start looking at our federal law and writing it to the level that people can understand it and not having attorneys or lawyers that are trained, school trained lawyers write it so that then you need school trained lawyers to interpret it for the average everyday American. Um, I'm no, by no means a, uh, a scholar when it comes to writing. So you can guarantee that the laws and uh, bills that I will put forward, everybody will understand them. Um, and I just appreciate all of the, the support and all of the people that have reached out during this election cycle. All right. And Rich, you know, that 10% congressional approval rating isn't just something that came on the radar this year. It's been like that for a while now. I mean, almost a decade, if not more. But it seems so weird that you know, people can elect a new Congress or at least a House every two years, and the and we still have the same characters in there every single two years. So there are other options. There's more going on November 8th than just the presidential election. There's Congress, uh, a co-equal branch, and we're trying to put some co-equal uh, media time to, to it as well. So you're asking for two years uh, in the rep House of Representatives to see what you can do to represent. And thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Good luck in your campaign. And people can find out more at, uh, at Turvey, T-U-R-V-E-Y-F-O-R, congress.org. I hope you have a good day. Thanks, sir. Hey, thank you. Have a good day.